If you would, open your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, let's just jump right in. I don't, I don't know about you, I'm ready to just jump right in. Anybody ready to jump right in? John chapter 10. We're going to read verse 10. Once again, Jesus is speaking here. He says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Of course, as I stated, Jesus is speaking here, and ultimately, the thief that he was speaking about is an individual the Bible calls the devil, calls him Satan. We understand that he is the enemy of our souls. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, the Bible talks about how he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Calls, it calls him our adversary. And most of us already know this, from experience, Satan has stolen uh, from so many of us, whether it's our health, our wealth, our relationships, some of our reputations, uh, the success that we were supposed to have in business or ministry, uh, peace of mind, and so much more. And God wants to repay all that Satan has stolen from you. I'm going to say it again. God wants to repay all, I said all, every little bit of what Satan has stole from you. In fact, not only does he want to do that, he wants Satan, he wants to make Satan pay for even attacking you. You know, it's almost payday here, at least at Word of Faith. Paydays on Friday, and most people who live from paycheck to paycheck have had the experience of kind of hanging on to that last couple dollars, kind of stretching them out, trying to make it to payday. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I, I, we all, most of us know what that's like. We, 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 we're hanging on, man. We, we're counting down the, 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 the nickels and the pennies, just telling ourselves, if I can just get to payday, I'll be all right. Well, I know there's some of us who are in a very similar situation. We've been under attack, as I mentioned. Satan's been hitting you. He's been, he's been tearing, attacking you in so many different ways. But God has seen this, and God has, is, is poised to cause your payday to come up. Come on, there's a day where Satan's got to pay you back for what has happened in your life. There's a day where God will restore what was taken from you and give you more. Your payday is coming. Turn to him and tell him, payday is coming. Turn to somebody else and tell him, payday is coming. Find somebody else and tell him, I said, payday is coming. Hang on a little longer because your payday is coming. It's closer than you think it is. A day where God will restore all, and the enemy will have to pay. So go with me if you would to 2 Kings chapter 8. And let me prove this to you. Let me just show a few things to you. Y'all help me preach this tonight. It's coming. I said it's coming. It's coming. Hang in there. Hang in there. You might feel like you're on that last strand of faith. It's all I got left, Lord. It's the last song I can sing. Hang in there. Payday's coming. I'm going to say it again. It's coming. Second Kings chapter 8. Most of us know this story. This is the story of a woman who had a relationship with the prophet of God. God really used her to be a blessing to him, then God used him to be a blessing to her. And so at the beginning of this chapter, we find that the man of God kind of gives her a spiritual tip, says, hey, if famine's on the way, you ought to get out of Dodge. 
So she left her house, took her son, went and lived among the Philistines for seven years during the famine. And when the famine was over, she came back. And verse 3 reads, It came to pass after seven years end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines, and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. So apparently when she came back, she found out that somebody had stolen her house and her land. So she's going to go to the king to, so that he can make it right. And you know, that might be kind of hard to prove after seven years. I mean, that would be hard to prove today. But how about back then? So this may be a bit of a long shot proposition. But we read verse 4. It says the king talked with Gehazi. That was a prophet, of course, servant. As it says here, the servant of the man of God. Saying, tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life, that behold, check this out. The woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. And when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore how much? Restore all that was hers. That's her house and her land. And. And all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land even until now. So I want you to notice, notice that she occupied another home out of necessity. Then came home and got back her house and her land. So God restored what had been taken from her. But God is not just into bringing restoration into your life. I like what I heard one minister say, God's a God who will bring restoration plus. And here, he didn't just say restore all that was hers, but all the fruit, all the revenue is what, one way that word is translated, that has come from her land during those seven years. Give that back to her. Now get this, because that means that somebody else worked that land during those seven years. And they may not have known it. They were her enemy. But they, and they may not have known it. But while they were working the land, they were working the land for her. Y'all not hearing me. They were doing all this work, gathering it up, thinking they were gathering it up for themselves. But what God was doing is having the wicked work for the righteous because that was the right thing. That's what should have happened. In fact, go to Job 27. Her enemy did the work and she reaped the rewards because God is a God who will make sure you get your payday. She did what God told her to do. And God honored that by giving her back what she lost and some. I don't know about you, I'm believing God for the and some. I want what I lost and some. I, I, come on now, I didn't just lose the money, I lost years. I want the money, the years, everything else related to it. Come on, I want the and some. Look at it, Job 27. Verse 13, it says, this is the portion of a wicked man with God. This is his harvest. The heritage of oppressors which they shall receive of the Almighty. Verse 16, though he heap up. Mm, sounds like there's a lot. Silver as the dust. There is a lot. And prepare, that means to provide, to set up raiment as the clay. He may prepare it, but the just shall put it on. And the innocent, innocent shall divide the silver. Do you see that right there? He's saying, although the wicked man may be working real hard to, to get so much silver, it's like dust. He may be doing all this work, but by the time when God steps in, what's going to happen is that what was in the enemy's hand is going to end up in the righteous's hand. The righteous won't even be the one that has done the work. God will just say, this is judgment, and give it to the righteous instead. That's called a payday. You see the same thing in Ecclesiastes chapter 2? Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Verse 26, 
It reads, for God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. There it is again. Saying, I'll, I'll give the, um, the person that has stood against me a job. And their job is going to be to gather up harvest so they can give it to you. Now, you might say, well, why would they give it to me? Well, one more scripture, Proverbs 28. Just looking at this woman's payday and seeing that what happened to her is actually consistent with what we find elsewhere in scripture. It's consistent with what God will do for any of his children that obey him and believe him for. Proverbs 28, verse 8. He that usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance. Sounds like somebody that's being wicked. He shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. Verse 27 says, he that giveth unto the poor shall not lack. See, the thing about the righteous person is that they've been living right. Whether they're giving to the poor or they're walking in love or whatever term, whatever it is that they're doing that's pleasing God, they're living their life in a way that pleases God. And when you live your life in a way that pleases God, a couple of things happen. Number one, Satan will attack you. Amen. And number two, sometimes you will seem like you are, you're leaving something behind. I'm sacrificing something to do for God. And when you do that, God is a God who will step in and make sure you are paid back. He'll make sure you have your own payday. You know, Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 10. In fact, go to Mark chapter 10. I'm already off my message, so I might as well just keep on rolling. Somebody say, it's coming. Your payday is coming. It's 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 coming. Just as sure as your next payday is coming in the workplace, the payday God has for you is coming. God's going to restore all and. Mm. If I'm the only one to get excited about this tonight, then all right. But I hope that somebody else gets a hold of it. Come on, you got to hear the word of God. By faith, you got to receive that word and say, yep, that's me. That applies to me. That's what my future looks like. And that's when you'll see it. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Jesus had just finished talking about how a person who trusts in riches will have a hard time getting in the kingdom of God. And verse 28, Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we've left all and have followed thee. Like, wait a minute. We left everything. What do we get? Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that have left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. Sounds like sacrificing for the kingdom. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we lose relationship with some family members because we choose to follow God, and they, 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 they choose not to honor that. Sometimes we pass up uh, poss you know, job opportunities because we refuse to be engaged in something that we know is wrong before God. Come on, sometimes you know, we pass that fine woman or that fine man up. Come on now, don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. They seem to be everything you want, but you know they don't love God. They're not serving God. They're not who God has for you. There are times that you have to pick up your cross and follow him. But if you do that, rest assured that when it's all said and done, you will not have lost at all. Instead, you'll see that God has paid you back and given you some more because you are willing to do these things for him. And isn't that what verse 30 says? But you shall receive a hundredfold. That's not just payback. That's payback plus something. Now in this time. So he's not talking about when I get to heaven. There is reward when you get to heaven. But he's talking about this life right now. Houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, and lands. With persecutions, you always have haters. But I don't know about you. I'd rather have haters because I have something than because I don't. And in the world to come, eternal life. So notice here, God is talking about the fact that if you've given up things for him, you're living right before him, payday is coming. And if you've been doing that for a while, I'm here to tell you, you're closer to your payday than you ever have been before. Go to Job chapter 42. 
Sometimes when we have to give up things for the kingdom of God or we, we seem to lose out on things, we focus only on what we've lost instead of thinking about what we've gained. I know when I was reading that scripture one day about brethren and, and you know, getting family because I follow Jesus, I, 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 I struggle with it because I'm thinking, well, you know, you, maybe you only got one brother or one sister or one uncle or one aunt. There's only so many of them. And if they walk away from God, or walk away from you because you walk away from God, how do you get that back? And then the Lord helped me to see, well, don't forget, every single person that's in the body of Christ is your brother or your sister as well. So you might have lost these five people, but God gave you 5,000. And if you'll enter in relationship with them like you were willing to with them, you'll have the full benefit of that. That's the reason why you got to do life together. As a Christian, you cannot decide, well, I'm going to follow Jesus, but then not get engaged in relationship with others who follow Jesus. You'll be miserable. And that's why some people are miserable, because you're not hanging out with the with people that don't follow God like you used to, but you're not hanging out with people that do follow God. So you're just living by yourself on an island, and no wonder you're having a hard time living the life God has for you or enjoying life. Take what God has given you, give your life to it, and enjoy it like God wants you to enjoy it. Now, that was not a part of my message, but that's for somebody tonight. Come on, Job chapter 42. Job 42. Most of us know the story of Job. Job was in fear about his children. It opened the door for Satan to attack him. Satan decided he wanted to challenge God, and his goal was to prove to God that he could get Job to curse him. So, bottom line is, Job was attacked by Satan. Satan took out his family. Satan took out uh, his, uh, his possessions. Satan took his health. Even his wife told Job, curse God and die. He lost everything. And so we read the longest pity party in the Bible throughout the book of Job until a young man steps in and interrupts Job and some of these older guys because they're all off. And finally, after he gets done, God steps in and corrects Job. And then God finds Job's friends and tells them, you guys are wrong and you better go get Job to pray for you because if he doesn't, you're going to pay for what you said. And this is after Job gets himself right with God because he had to get right. He said, I'm sorry, man. I, you know, I'm just dust and ashes. I'm sorry. God says, all right. And then he tells them, now you better go find Job and have him pray for you because I'll listen to his prayers. I ain't listening to you, knucklehead. Now, he may not have said knucklehead, but you, that's what he said. You know what I'm saying? So he does. They come to Job. Job prays for them. And verse 10 is very interesting. It says, and the Lord turned again, turned the captivity of Job. He turned the captivity of Job. What's very interesting here is the Hebrew word translated turned here is the same word translated restore in 2 Kings chapter 8. And the, the word captivity here is also very interesting. I, mean, I had to keep looking at it when I was studying it because I couldn't get my head around it. Um, but then it, it dawned on me, and it's referring to a former state, former state of prosperity. So the best way to say this is, is how the RSV translation says, God restored the fortunes of Job. In other words, he brought him back to where he was. The New King James Version simply says, the Lord restored Job's losses. The Bible in basic English says it this way, the Lord made up to Job for all his losses. And realize that in this case, God did this. In the case of the woman in 2 Kings 8, God set that up. That wasn't a coincidence. That was a Holy Ghost setup. God did that. And what's going to happen in your life is what God is going to do in your life. And nobody can stop God from doing what God wants to do. And God is doing this because this is what he wants for you. So here he, he restores to Job everything he lost. But that's not the end of the story. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, Job was a rich man before. The Bible says that he was the richest man in all of the East. How rich would you be if you were the richest man in the Orient today? He was the richest man in all of the East. And when God got done, he didn't just restore all that Job lost. He looked at what Job had and made sure Job got double for his trouble. 
And he's a God who does that. He is in the business of giving double for your trouble. You know, I won't take you there for time's sake, but even under the law, there were a number of commands they were given that if a thief were found, he had to pay back double what he took. And, and many places in the Old Testament when God talked about judgment for people that turned away from him or were wicked, he would say, you're going to get double for your sins. And, of course, there are places in the Bible like first, first, uh, Isaiah 61. Go to Isaiah 61. See, God doesn't just want to give you back what you lost. He wants to give you something else, too. It's like, you know, many of us, we're about to have Christmas season. If you work at a, 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 a company that does this, you'll get a paycheck, and then they'll throw a Christmas bonus on top. Is anybody thankful for the Christmas bonus? Yeah, man. Hey, man, I want, my, I want what, I, 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 what I'm owed and some. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Right? And God will do that, and God will do it to a place where he'll give you double. Look at Isaiah 61 and verse 7. Now, this is talking, this is really a millennial opening of Scripture, but I want you to see something about how God thinks and what God will do. Verse 7 says, for your shame you shall have what? Double. Oh, y'all didn't say that loud enough. For your shame you shall have what? Double. And for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess the what? The double everlasting joy shall be unto them. You know, I still like playing Monopoly. Anybody play Monopoly? Now, you know, I don't like playing it with like five people with an actual board because I like actually living my life and not spending it playing Monopoly for 10 hours. But <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about, right? But I have Monopoly on my phone. And you can play the computer. And sometimes I'll be sitting in the airport or on a plane or something. I'll be bored. There's nothing you can do. And I'll just start playing Monopoly. And I love to get the railroads. You know what I'm talking about? It's part of my strategy. I'm going to get the railroads. You go get part place. I'm getting the railroads. I'm going to bankrupt you so fast. And it's cool when you get one. They got to pay a certain amount. But when you get two, now it's double what they have to pay. And I'm here to tell you, this is how God works. God is saying, you know what? Satan came and attacked your family. He came and attacked your body. He came and attacked your money. He came and attacked your ministry. He attacked your, your, your career. I'm not just going to pay you back everything that he's owed from you, but now he's going to have to give you double. You see, it belonged to the world. It was behind the gates of hell. But now, because I'm involved and my blessing is on you, you're going to kick down a gate and go in and grab what used to belong to the devil because he now has to give you double for your trouble. Come on, that's the kind of God we serve. You shouldn't just believe God for restoration. You should believe God for double what I lost. Satan, you owe me double of the money you took from me. Every dollar I pay for medical costs, I don't want that back. I want that and double. Come on now. Glory to God. That's the kind of God he is. He will cause your payday to come, and when your payday comes, it's going to be big. And I want you to know it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Come on, I'm not just preaching this because I, I pulled a book out and figured out what should I preach on. The Lord dropped this in my heart this morning when I was praying to let you know that payday is coming. That's part of what 2017 is, a year of divine outpouring from heaven where payday shows up. Hallelujah. Go to John chapter 12. Somebody say it's coming. Man, you ought to be on the lookout for it. You ought to wake up tomorrow saying, hey, is it payday? Is it payday? Is it payday? Because you know it's coming. You know the kind of God you serve. John 12, verse 23, Jesus is speaking. He says, and Jesus answered him, saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. What's he talking about? He's talking about his resurrection. But you can't rise from the dead without dying first. So he says in verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn or a seed of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This is some deep stuff right here. 
Now, Jesus is talking about himself. And he's talking about the fact that he, he was about to lose his life. He's going to give up his life. He would be dead to the world. Satan will think that he's won. But God wouldn't just raise Jesus from the dead. But he would raise Jesus from the dead, and it would lead to many, 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 many more being raised from the dead as well, becoming sons and daughters of God. This is why the Bible says, had the princes of this world known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan was so focused on taking out Jesus, he didn't realize that he was being set up. He didn't realize it was all a part of God's plan. So here he rushes in to crucify Jesus, drags him down into hell, thinking that he's won this thing, and after three days, he hears a sound. Come on, the Holy Ghost likes to come in with the sounds. So I believe that was a sound. He looks over at Jesus, and Jesus, he, maybe he was one minute, he was just laying there, next minute he's energized. Looks at Satan, uh-oh. And then Jesus walks out and boom, you know, starts, the Bible says he spoiled principalities and powers. He bit, put a beat down on Satan and all of his demons grabbed the keys of hell in the grave, which is the last thing that Satan wanted to give up. It was those keys that caused him or gave him the right to send every person on the planet to hell forever. It was the last thing that he wanted to give up, and the only way Jesus could ever get it is if he went to hell to get it. So here Jesus is defeating Satan, grabbing the keys, rising from the dead. And the Bible teaches that there were a lot of Old Testament saints down in, in hell, but in a place called Abraham's bosom. So we're talking about Abraham and David and all those righteous folk who watched this. And when Jesus rose from the dead, they got to rise up with him. So much so the Bible says the graves in Jerusalem opened and they walked the streets of Jerusalem and then they went up into heaven and they were just the first of those who would be much fruit. Anybody that's chosen to follow Jesus is now a son of God, a daughter of God. All of us have an amazing future because God is not a God who won't, who will just restore you. He'll restore you with much fruit. Come on now. He'll restore you and some. That was payday for Jesus. And God's got a payday for you. Go to Judges chapter 16. Man, Satan had to hate that. He had to hate that. Yeah, the Bible talks about how now at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Satan has to watch every moment of that. It's very similar to what God wants to do with us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, you comfort me. Goes on to talk about how do you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. See, that's what God will do. The very people that try to take you out will be the ones that have to watch you eat good. Have to watch you receive what God promised you. It's part of your, your payment. I mean, that's part of God giving you your payday. Now, some people might hear this and say, well, you know, Pastor, this is good, but, you know, I, I really haven't been righteous like you talked about. I surely haven't been living like Jesus. So, I don't know if this applies to me. Well, look at Judges chapter 16, and I, I'm, I'm going to go here because I believe it's for somebody. So if you're hearing this and go, okay, that's good. I don't know how, what good that's do for me. Well, they don't worry about it. Somebody next to you getting their life rocked. <laughs> I just felt like, you know, I was being meditating. Lord, why would you want me to go here? How does this fit? But he wants me to go here. So here's the story of Samson. Now, Samson was somebody God called with a specific purpose of beginning the process of delivering God's people from the Philistines. That's what he was called to do. That was his why. And yet Samson was a real temperamental guy, man. You know, don't think that just because you might have a few issues that God can't use you. Everybody has issues. 
You may not always see what they are. You know, when people are in their element doing their thing, that they're good at it, you almost get the idea that they're perfect. But no, that's just them at their best. Thank God for that. That's them in their, in their greatness. But that doesn't mean there's some stuff beneath the surface that God's not working on. Come on now. See, I'm a preacher's kid. I've been, I've been around preachers my whole life. I have been around ministry my whole life. So I have watched how people will idolize a preacher. And then in the background, he'd be like the devil, man. Get up in front of the people and the anointing would fall. People get saved. People get healed. And then the guy would be a monster. And, I, you know, as a preacher's kid growing up, I'd be like, God. And one of the things he helped me to get a hold of was you, you ought to be thankful I'm like that because I got to deal with you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord, for your mercy. I'm so glad you're such a merciful God. Thank you, Jesus. Be merciful unto him, Lord, because I know that means you'll be merciful unto me. I've watched that and wondered how is this possible? But, you know, God is merciful. And God gives people space to repent. And if they eventually, and sometimes that space might be a while, it might be years, it might be decades. But God can use them and use them, but, you know, he's expecting them to grow, and if they just continue to go the wrong way, then the day will come where the wrong kind of payday will show up. You know, Kenneth Hagin talks about, and he came up during the healing revival, and the healing revival swept America. I mean, it was a major event in our nation's history. It's probably not talked about more today because most of our media and most of our schools are run by people who are anti-God now. So they've wiped the history books of a lot of things that points to God and the Christian uh, heritage of this nation. But back then, I mean, you had multiple men of God who had tents. They just go into different cities and set up tents with 10,000 people and they'd have services and people would get healed all over the place. And it was just a it, you know, we, we, we hear about Oral Roberts, but there were so many more. I mean, Pastor Deborah, I'm sure she told her story. She was healed at one of those tents, one of those meeting, meetings. So these guys are coming up, and God's using them to heal people like every other night, man. And it's just, you know, it's just multitudes of people. And God had Brother Hagin as a prophet to go to at least two of these guys and warn them about their behavior. One of them, his pride was just completely out of control. And pride is just as dangerous in a minister is as, as, as if he's sleeping around or stealing money. I think Lester Summerall said is he, what gets, got, gets ministers is the gold, the girls, or the glory. Now, if ministers get caught up in the gold, we're like, oh, yeah, man, we, he, he, he need to chill out. The girls, yeah, but the glory, we run after him. We join the ministry and we defend him and we do all kinds of stuff. I watched this kind of stuff do happen in ministries that I was a part of before. You know, go running after folk that they need Jesus. Let me shut up. Let me keep moving. So he, God, Lord had him go to, I can think of one in particular, I believe, and told him, man, you got to get yourself together. And the Lord's telling you this. And he didn't listen. He died early. Another one, too, same thing. Lord, Lord warned him, if you don't get this together, you're going to lose your life. God was using him mightily. One day, he's gone. So you know, God is merciful. He gives people space. But if they don't make a correction, they open the door for Satan to come in and take them out. Okay? Now, I don't know how I got off on all of that because I'm trying not to preach for everyone on Wednesday night. But Samson, that's what we were talking about, Samson. <laughs> He's one of them guys, man, temperamental guy. And, um, but God's anointing on him, and he's anointed to fight. That's the anointing on his life. There are some people who are anointed to carry the badge, to carry the rifle, to fly the fighter jet, you name it. Anointed. I mean, they have a supernatural ability to kick your butt. I'm serious. Samson was like that. But Samson uh, was, he, he, he was in sin, you know, sleeping around people he wasn't married to and all that kind of stuff. And God told him, you know, he knew he was wrong and he, he knew that he was not supposed to let anybody know that 
His hair should not be cut because what, the secret to his success was he was a Nazarite. There are certain things he honored. And you know the story. He starts, you know, shacking up with Delilah. And she starts bugging him. What's the secret to your strength? You know, and he, he lies. You don't love me. He lies again. You don't love me. If you love me, you tell me. And she just keeps going until she drives him nuts. And finally he tells her. And, and every time he told her, she would do what he said. And you would think he'd be, you know, like, wait a minute. If I told you this would take away my strength. And I woke up, and it, you did it, and then the Philistines was outside the house. Then it happened again. Then it happened. you think at some point he'd be like, but no, ladies, you can get the brother's head all messed up. <laughs> brothers can do it to ladies too. So we know the story. Finally, she cuts his hair. The Philistines come. He shakes himself. He's expecting God's power to be there. He goes out to fight. And he doesn't have that power, and they take him, and they take his, his eyes out. And now, instead of him defeating the Philistines, they are emboldened. Now his people are really in trouble. And the lords of the Philistines, called, they call everybody together. They're about to have this party to celebrate the fact that their God, Dagon, the fish God, has given them the right, has given them Samson. They've defeated God's champion. So during this party, you know, the Bible says there were 3,000 people on the roof. In fact, we'll read verse 27. The house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and they were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. They brought Samson out. They wanted him to just kind of, you know, he, he can't see. He's just blind, and they just enjoying watching him move around, making fun of him, just like he lost. And Samson called unto the Lord his God. And said, called unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee. Clearly got his heart right. Strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. So he's asking God, repay them. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. Get this. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. You know, he still fulfilled his purpose. Even in the end, God repaid his enemies, and God helped him accomplish his purpose. Sure, he lost out on some things because of the choices that he made, but when it was all said and done, his payday came. He's still going to be able to stand in heaven and say, I did what I was called to do. I blew it on the way, but God's merciful. That's the kind of God he is. And, I, and this reminds me of what the Bible talks about in Joel chapter 2. I won't take you there because we've talked about it many times before. But in Joel 2, God is talking to them about how their nation is in shambles, and it's because of their sin. He's saying this is because of how you've been living. But then he says, turn to me. Rent your, rent, rent your heart and not your clothes. You know, truly be sorry for what you've done. Truly come and get right with me. And if you'll do that, I will restore all the years that have been taken from you. And remember, these are years that they lost because of their sin. So God's not saying, well, you did all of that, and so you, got, you, you, you lost all that because you was messing around. You ought to just be thankful I took you back. I'll bless you from here on out. No, he said, yeah, I'll bless you from here on out. But I'm going to look back at all those years that you lost when you were messing around. You were against me. And I'm going to restore all of that as well. And that's the kind of God we serve. That even if you messed up, you feel like you've destroyed your life, if you'll just repent, God will repay. And he'll make the enemy pay. He'll repay to you what you lost and some. Even your payday is coming. Somebody say, it's coming. it's coming. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Samson still accomplished his purpose, and so will you. So what do we have to do to make sure we have our payday? It's actually very simple. Y'all get anything out of this? Yeah. Verse 9. We looked at this the other day. It says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. 
For in due season we shall reap. That's what we just finished saying. There's a payday coming. You've been doing the right thing. Don't get tired of doing the right thing because there is a due season. There is a payday that is on the way. You will receive it if. Biggest two-letter word in the English language. If. And the if isn't dependent on the devil. It's not dependent on your family, your friends, or it's not even dependent on God. It's depending on you. If you faint not. The Bible in basic English says it this way, if you don't give way to weariness. The New King James Version says it this way, if you do not lose heart. Isn't that what happens when you give up, when you quit? You just you get discouraged and you just say, forget it. Young's literal translation says it this way, not desponding. What's that, being depressed? Why are you depressed? Because you gave up. And one other translation says it this, simply, simply this way, if we don't give up. So God is basically telling you, you are guaranteed to have your payday if you simply don't quit. Turn to him and tell him, don't quit. A couple months ago, we had a, a super fight. I think it was uh, Mayweather and Conor McGregor. And um, I don't remember how much money they made, but I know somebody made like $100 million, something crazy like that. And my wife, you know, she was joking around like, honey, I'm about to put you in the gym. <laughs> like, all you got to do is just last one round. <laughs> you, you, you're bigger than them guys, last one round. You can just give me one round and give me $100 million, come on. <laughs> well, I wish that were true. But in real life, you may not have to fight against Mayweather, but you are fighting against the enemy. And all you got to do is last. Do you hear what I just said? You don't even have to figure out how to get a punch in. You ain't got to figure out how to, you don't, you, all you've got to do is last. Just refuse to quit. Somebody turn, turn to somebody else, tell them don't quit. I like something I read Lillian, Lillian B. Yeoman said. She said, faith doesn't know how to quit. And it doesn't. Faith doesn't quit. So there are four things that you shouldn't quit. Number one, and I'm going to stop because I'm over time. Well, I'm right about on, on time. Don't quit believing. Don't quit believing. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we walk by and not by Faith is 100% confidence in God. So what I'm saying, how I'm acting is dependent on what God has said about it. That's what I'm living by. Not by what I see, what I feel, what other people may say. No, I, I don't live by that. I live by what God said in his word, what God said to my heart. And that's important. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is a must. If you quit believing, then you disqualify yourself from your payday. You must believe. And if you're having a hard time believing, go back to the scriptures that you started with. Go back to those things in your prayer journal that God spoke to you and stay in it until faith is rebirthed in your heart. Number two, don't quit living right. When I say living right, I mean living holy. Because some people's idea of living right is not God's way of living right. Verse 7 here says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. So here's the thing. You don't want to disqualify yourself from your harvest by actively living in sin. And you don't want to qualify yourself for the different type of harvest. The one called judgment. That's what Samson did. So you got to make a decision. I'm not going to allow what's happening to me to push me back to the bottle or into the arms of somebody or to the pornography 
or back to cussing or whatever it is that God delivered you from. Because that's how Satan works. He attacks you until you get so down that you go find whatever you used to do to somehow encourage you. And what happens is you end up, end up feeling even worse than you did, and you may have disqualified yourself from your payday. So don't quit living right. Number three, don't quit hanging with God. Don't quit hanging with God. You know, David was in a situation in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. He was greatly distressed. His own men were talking about stoning him. But then he went and encouraged himself and the Lord his God. Instead of running from God, he ran to God. He got back in God's presence. What often what we do is when we get upset, sometimes we get mad at God, and so we stop praying, we stop reading the Bible, we stop going to church. And this is, you, listen, don't run from God when you need him the most. Come on, that's a big statement. Don't run from God when you need him the most. Come on, that, tweet that. Because that, that is real. You ought to continue to walk with God. The Bible talks about having the communion of the Holy Ghost. He, you know, the Bible says in Genesis that Enoch had habitual fellowship with God. No matter what's going on in your life, you need the anchor of your prayer life and your Bible, your word life, to help you to keep walking with God. That'll help you to have the strength to not quit. And then number four, don't quit forgiving. Don't quit forgiving. I'm going to read Ephesians 4 to you because this is so good. Verse 31 says, let all bitterness, acridity, you know, it says acid in your heart towards somebody, and wrath, that means passion, and anger, which means you, know, you want vengeance, and clamor, that's just straight drama, and evil speaking, that word means vilification. I don't know about you, but I was reading this, finding myself in the scripture. Oh, don't look at me like you, you, you ain't finding yourself too. <laughs> you vilifying. They did this, they did this, they, you're vilifying. Yeah. No, nope. he says, let all of this be put away from you yeah. with all malice, with all evil intent. And do what? And be ye kind one to another, yeah. even to your haters, even to your enemies. Yeah. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Remember that story in Matthew 18 of the man who was forgiven of millions of dollars of debt and then he turned around and found somebody that owed him about $20 and refused to forgive him. And then the king found out and had him thrown in prison. And God's saying, that's you. Whatever they did to you is just $20 compared to what he's forgiven you of. And you need to forgive. And yet I have found that forgiveness, I think we, we sometimes do a little injustice when we talk about it because we say it's a decision. It is a decision. You have to make a quality decision, and I forgive you. But it's the kind of decision that you have to continually enforce. It's like a continuing action. It's like I'm constantly forgiving, forgiving. Do you know why I say that? Because you made that decision, but those emotions are still there. Those thoughts are still there. You stay still come in, your, come in the room sometimes. You still find yourself having to have a conversation and sitting next to them and all. And, and, and every time you do, at least at first, all that stuff come up again. And, you, and there's a party like, no, you forgave them. You forgave them. But it's like, it's like your little spiritual voice. You forgave them. You forgave them. And you're, 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 they're a punk, man. They can't stand them. You know what they did. But you forgave them. You know, am I the only one that has that problem? I, no, I'm not the only one. Yeah, so what do I have to do? I got to make a decision to stick with my decision. Jesus forgave me, I forgive them. I refuse to think about this. I refuse to hold, I, 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 I pardon them. Like they didn't do it. And you got to keep doing that because walking in unforgiveness will keep you from your payday. So you got to, you can't quit forgiving them. And you know, some people, they won't just do something to you once. You forgave them. You treat them right. And they do it again. And you forgave them. You treat them right. And, they do, and they've been doing this for years. And they never, they don't ever say I'm sorry. They don't even acknowledge they did anything wrong. In fact, they will take what they did wrong 
and turn that around and talk about you and what you did and attack you like they ain't crazy. I can see I ain't the only one that deal with this in this place. You're in the middle of all of that, and yet you can't quit forgiving them. You got to say, oh, I, I forgive you. And next time, I forgive them. Next time, you're just on my forgiveness list. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive them. You can't let that stuff stay there because it will keep you from what God has for you. Let me, let me end here. Go to Romans chapter 16. I'm just going to read the scripture. You guys have heard me read it many times before. It's just one of my favorite scriptures, but I think it really fits tonight. Somebody say, it's coming. It's coming. Romans 16, verse 20, reads in this way, And the God of peace, peace shall bruise, that word literally means to crush, Satan under whose feet? That's right, under your feet. When? Your when? Your when? Your In other words, any moment now. Any moment now, God's going to pick you up and stump you right on Satan's head. You're going to look up and say, payday is here. And you're going to give God the praise and glory for it. So stand on your feet right now. Let's just thank God in advance because we accept what he said to us tonight. We believe it. We're in expectation of it. We refuse to quit. And we will have it in Jesus' name. Thank him for it. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you. We believe your word. We are in expectation, Father. We know any moment now it's happening. Thank you for restoration plus reward for us. Like you did for so many in the Bible, like you did for Ruth and others that we didn't even talk about. Thank you for it, Father. We believe it. We expect it. We thank you for it in advance in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Come on, if you really if you believe that, you ought to thank him for it. You ought to thank him. Thank him in advance. Thank you for it, Father. Every single bit of what's been stolen will be restored. And there'll be reward. And there'll be reward. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That's good stuff. I didn't take you there for time's sake, but... You know, and I'll just mention to you in Ruth chapter 2, this is what I just said is exactly what happened. It, Boaz said, God will repay you for what you've done, and he will reward you. And that's what we're talking about. I'm looking for, to be repaid, and I'm looking to be rewarded. And that's what we're going to have. And when God does it, make sure you share the good news. It encourages somebody else's faith. Amen. Glory to God. Well, every head bowed, every